Hi, everybody. Welcome to workshop number four in your path to financial success, sponsored by LMU. Um, we're happy to have you here today. So you've already had a few sessions before me. So the first one was in regards to setting financial goals. The second one related to evaluating your job offer and compensation. The third one about budgeting. This one continues where those three left off. And we're going to talk about retirement savings and investing. So thanks for joining me today. Here's the agenda. Quick look at that and then we'll get started. Okay, so what is the purpose of saving? So I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but at a high level, there's four buckets that you're gonna be thinking about when you start to take home a paycheck. And if you're anything like I, position I was in when uh, I graduated from college, I had no money in the bank, uh, student loans, and then some credit card bills in my specific situation to buy suits for my first accounting job. So um, you start collecting paychecks and uh, the first bucket that you're gonna be thinking about is cash for emergencies. I believe uh, John Akoniak already talked about that a little bit. Just some liquid assets available in case the unexpected happens. Uh, it kind of gives you peace of mind. And then you go through these categories. The very last one, it seems like it's kind of the residual after the other three are taken care of, but I believe it's a lot more than that and integral to start retirement savings right away after you start collecting paychecks. Many of you are gonna be working for companies that offer 401k plans. That's a natural place to start. And uh, one strong suggestion I have is take full advantage of those 401k plans when you begin uh, your job. Um, uh, retirement savings is so amazing, the power of compounding when you start early. So you've probably seen this kind of a chart before, but it's a core concept in finance that there is a trade-off between risk and return. So at one end of the spectrum, you have cash, which offers really nothing in the way of return, but is absolutely risk-free. At the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, investments in equities, maybe real estate, but predominantly equities. Uh, over a very long period of time, you've had kind of 10% return per year in the equity market, but there have been plenty of times when you've seen 20% declines or more, so there's a lot of volatility around it. And uh, obviously, uh, those four buckets fall within different kinds of parameters when it comes to how much risk you want to take in your investment portfolio, starting with emergency funds. I would say no risk in that. That is simply cash tucked on the sideline and checking account, savings account. Uh, up to what we're going to talk about in a minute is retirement savings at the other end of the duration spectrum. And it really is a unique bucket of assets within your wealth management category because of its expansive duration. Now, retirement savings, I say a 40-year mindset, and that 40 years assumes that you're going to start working at 22 and retire at 62. Sounds pretty nice, but the reality is that that's just the beginning because you're hoping to probably you're anything like me, live another 40 years beyond and enjoy the fruits of all of that retirement savings that you've been able to collect. So this is a, compl a completely unique and very, very long duration pool of money that you're putting together through your working career. And I say too, but there's really three components that comprise your retirement savings. The first is any money you start out with. So some of you, the lucky few may have some kind of assets when you begin your career after you graduate from LMU. That's um, for most a pretty small or uh, immaterial part of their portfolio. The second sliver is uh, regular flows that come about through monthly contributions to 401k plans and other retirement savings. That's a larger component. And then the third, and believe it or not, the largest component of your retirement savings is going to be the accrual of the investment income you will earn over time. And all of that is with the mindset that you're going to be using that to generate real income in retirement. Um, one thing I do wanna stress is embracing this long-term thinking when it comes to your retirement savings. 
So absolutely, there's a tendency, particularly when your nest egg begins to accumulate and become a little bit larger, maybe in your 30s, that you look at the month end statements or the quarter end statements. I urge you to please um, minimize your attention to that kind of short term volatility. It really does not matter. Even year to year volatility makes no difference when you're thinking about an asset that you're accumulating over a 40 year period. The goal is truly real growth over the long term. So save early, never stop. Um, no one says many of these financial concepts better than Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha. And this is my favorite slide. I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on this because the scenario analysis I think is really informative to help kind of frame your thinking about the value of starting early and then saving throughout your accumulation phase that 40 years or whatever it ends up being. So this first example, if you had just $10,000 when you graduated, you invested over 40 years at a 7% return, uh, which is, you know, again, as I mentioned, uh, the market, the equity market over 50 years or so is averaged about 10% per year. So that's well below what the equity market has averaged historically. You'd be looking at a nest egg of about $150,000. And this is assuming no additional contributions over your working career. So by the way, the, um, the rate of return that you get on average makes a massive difference to what that future value looks like. So if you just moved that initial $10,000 scenario from a 7% return to a 10% return, you would be looking at about $550,000 in future value at age 62. The second scenario, say you don't start with $10,000, but you invest $10,000 per year into your retirement plans, uh, for 40 years, uh, that equals about $2 million in future value, again, assuming a 7% return. If you can somehow up that to 10% a year, then you'd be looking at more than double that amount, about $4.5 million. And all of those numbers, by the way, should comfortably exceed whatever inflation is going to give us over the next 40 years, meaning that you've built real wealth over time that will help you live a better real income once you um, hit retirement. Dollar cost averaging, just a quick word on that. So that means you contribute every month, no matter what, to your 401k plan and your retirement vehicles. Um, it forces discipline, it forces regular investment purchases. This is uh, um, a, a huge value add, particularly when you get to periods like March of 2020, when the world seemed really scary. Well, that was a scary time to invest. And if you were choosing each month to either invest or not invest, you might've withheld your contribution last March only to realize after the fact that that was the best buying opportunity for equities over the last 10 years. Asset allocation. Uh, this is uh, kind of the typical pie chart. This isn't a pie chart that I think is representative of what you all should be doing. It's just an example that you know, really just think about your asset allocations as a big pie and what the size of each slice is. The four main categories, again, cash, uh, the least volatile, the least risky. You should really expect no return equities, the highest return over time, but the most volatility as well. There is a tendency by a lot of uh, um, conservative savers, I would put myself in that same camp, to uh, um, have an underweight to equities and an overweight to cash because God forbid I lose money on my retirement slice, even if uh, retirement assets aren't required to be available for another 30 years. Well, uh, it sounds good in theory. The problem is that you won't keep up with inflation if you do that, which means each year you're your retirement assets will be worth a little bit less on a real basis. So it does make sense, particularly earlier in your career, to have um, a, a larger slice to equities and a smaller slice to cash, beginning to rotate that toward cash or fixed income away from equities as you near retirement. Again, don't be afraid of volatility. And I believe this next slide. So again, the uh, Oracle of Omaha providing us with some wisdom. And it really relates to uh, um, the instinct of wanting your accounts higher 
but uh, uh, all of you are going to be net accumulators of shares in the equity markets or um, income producing real estate, you know, whatever your retirement assets are allocated to. And what's better when you're a net purchaser of assets than if the price of those assets is lower? You know, if the equity market is suddenly down 30% and you're looking at that next contribution, you've effectively, with your savings, that next pool of savings, uh, been able to purchase a third more shares for the same dollar amount as you did the previous month. What could be better than that? Um, so uh, here's a few tips that I've learned over the years and I think um, uh, you all can utilize to some extent as well. Uh, again, I've already talked about this, don't be afraid of account volatility. Um, one one um, maybe not so intuitive recommendation is when the markets are down a lot, um, don't be afraid to look around and see if you can cut out uh, some expenses, even if you're only slightly increasing the amount that you put aside in these troughs in the down markets, it does lead to significant accretion of IRR over your accumulation phase. Um, we talked about the pre-tax savings element. Uh, I'm a strong advocate of taking full advantage of your 401k, IRA, any other pre-tax opportunities that exist. So the benefit of pre-tax opportunities, obviously, with a 401k, a lot of companies offer matches, which is effectively free money, like giving yourself a raise without doing anything extra. But pre-tax savings allow you to sell assets and then buy new assets without uh, the interruption of the compounding through the payment of capital gains taxes. So uh, just it, it, you want your compounding as, as high and uninterrupted as possible over the long run. And uh, the benefit of pre-tax is that you have lower, lower, um, um, uh, lower losses from, from the capital gains taxes that you have to pay, or even dividend and interest income taxation on that. And then uh, low cost investment options. Um, I, my experience is that advisors like to put their clients into somewhat more complex uh, offerings. And uh, one of the, uh, you know, the less altruistic reasons for doing that is that it allows them to charge higher fees. So my mother is in one of these plans and unfortunately she hasn't uh, given me any discretion over her retirement savings up to now. But if a broker is charging you 1% for the privilege of allocating your assets and then another 1% through fund fees that they're allocating to, that's a significant interruption in your ability to compound. So uh, keep it simple, I believe is the best, uh, the best mantra for your retirement savings and keep fees relatively on the lower side. In summary, uh, um, be consistent, be disciplined. Uh, uh, don't be afraid to put a little bit more into uh, real income producing assets when the markets get really tough and choppy. And uh, this is one thing that I didn't touch on earlier, but it's worth uh, kind of elaborating on. So dollars saved early in your career are worth way more than those later in your career because of this power of compounding. So let me give you just a couple of numbers. So if you chose for the first 20 years of your career to invest $10,000 a year, and then for the last 20 years of your career, zero, meaning that you spend all of that money that you would have otherwise allocated to retirement savings, and you earn that same 7% a year, you would have ended up with $1.6 million at age 62. Now, if you took the flip side of that and you didn't save anything for the first 20 years, and then the 10,000 a year for the, uh, the next 20 years before retirement, you would have only ended up with about $400,000 in future value retirement assets. So a 4x difference just by front loading your investment contributions. This is a, a massive benefit. Um, allow the power of compounding to work for you rather than against you. And then finally, keep it simple. Um, complexity is everywhere. And obviously there are thousands and thousands of investment products. Keep it simple and stick to the basics. And I'm pretty sure you'll end up satisfied with where you end up uh, at age 62, whatever that magic number is for you, where you choose to 
into your golden years. Here's my speaker bio. Um, again, I'm Ralph Birchmeyer. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much.